man must be prepared to accept notions of the cosmos and of his own place in the seething vortex of time whose merest mention is paralyzing. He must too be placed on guard against a specific lurking peril which may impose monstrous and unguessable horrors. My name is Nathaniel Wingate Beasley. I am the son of Jonathan and Hannah Beasley, the latter having perished a few weeks after my birth. I was born and reared in Arkham, prodigy at the age of 10, I won several awards, though my interest shifted to art quite early. At 18, I entered Miskatonic University as a drama student, where I was later offered the position of the youngest associate professor to ever be accepted by the university. My only family was my father, who held me as something more precious than his own life. It was on a Thursday that the queer amnesia came. Hours previous, certain brief, glimmering visions disturbed me greatly, because they were so unprecedented. My head was aching, and I had a singular feeling, altogether new to me, that someone else was trying to get possession of my thoughts. The collapse occurred at about 10.20 a.m. while I was teaching theatrical history. I slammed down, unconscious, in a stupor from which no one could arouse me. Nor did my rightful faculties again look out upon the daylight of our normal world for five years, four months, and thirteen days. I showed no sign of consciousness for sixteen and a half hours, though removed to the hospital and given the best of medical attention. At 3 a.m. my eyes opened, and my father was thoroughly frightened by the trend of my expression. It was clear that I had no remembrance of my identity and my past. My eyes glazed strangely at the persons around me, and the flexions of my facial muscles were altogether non-existent. It was a stroke of luck that only my father was in the house who witnessed my changes. For surely, if fathers were to gaze upon the being that resided in my body, they would not have been as generous in their patience and compassion as he. My speaking abilities now seemed to have abandoned me, and disregarding the existence of my father, I became eager for information of all sorts. My chief efforts were to master certain points in history, science, art, language and folklore, some of them tremendously abstruse and some childishly simple. At the same time, my father noticed that I had an inexplicable command of many almost unknown sorts of knowledge, a command which I seemed to wish to hide rather than display. I seemed anomalously avid to absorb the speech, customs and perspectives of the age around me, all the while delving deeper into the forbidden nature of the occult. From the moment of my strange waking, my father had regarded me with extreme horror and loathing vowing that I was some other alien usurping the body of his son. Something in my aspect seemed to excite vague fears and aversions in him. But I do not wonder at the horror caused, for certainly the mind, voice and facial expression of the being that awakened at the hospital were not those of Nathaniel Wingate Peasley. 
I was given charge of my funds and spent them slowly, and on the whole wisely, in study at various centers of learning around the globe. My travels were marked by abnormally rapid assimilation, as if the secondary personality had an intelligence enormously superior to my own. I have found, also, that my rate of reading was phenomenal. I could master every detail of a book merely by glancing over it as fast as I could turn the leaves. At 11.15 a.m., 27th of September, I stirred vigorously, and my hitherto mask-like face began to show signs of expression. Then, just afterwards, I began to mutter in English. The history of Eastern theatre is traced. Nathaniel Beasley had come back, a spirit in whose time scale it was still Thursday morning five years ago, with the academic heads of my university gazing at the battered desk beside me. It is, of course, from others that I have learned what had transpired. What I heard of my past actions astonished and disturbed me, but I tried to view the matter as philosophically as I could. About the middle of October, I returned to Arkham and settled down in my father's house, now my own, after his death three years following my bizarre collapse. The residence was in a mediocre state, and whispers around the city about my strange absence prevented me from securing any assistance in returning it to an acceptable condition. Having done all the work myself, I made an effort to rid the house of unnecessary paraphernalia from my immediate ancestry. That's when I stumbled upon the curious small trunk. Once I opened it, I saw three objects of no particular interest should one examine them on their own. But together, they generated a feeling of uneasiness and indeterminate fear. The pistol, as well as the photograph, were of my long-dead uncle Douglas, my mother's sibling, who ended his own life not long after my mother passed away. Having known his tragic story since I was 16, I was not particularly shocked till I had a closer look at the third object. It was clearly enough a sort of tiara. Its condition was almost perfect, except for the fact that whatever material the tiara was made of was now concealed between layers of archaic stone. After this brief but intense encounter with my dubious family past, I endeavored to resume my studies, a professorship position having been kindly offered to me by the college. By the end of the new term, I realized how badly my experience had shaken me. Vague dreams and queer ideas continually haunted me. During the dreams, I was not horrified at all, but upon awakening, I was breathless, as if my lungs had abruptly shut down. My reabsorption into normal life was a painful and difficult process. I was showing up late and tired for work and I gradually lost interest in anything that bore the least relation to my former everyday life. I also found myself unnaturally attracted to the sea. I started taking my father's car to drive down to a certain spot beside the seashore, not far from my house. There was an enchanting and hypnotizing quality about the water that I could not avoid, as if I was at home. The mere sight of fish sickened me, the first of many changes in my eating habits, changes that progressed into a powerful refusal to consume any kind of solid food. It was not immediately that these wild visions began to hold their terrifying quality. The glimpses themselves were at first merely strange rather than horrible. It is evident that with time the curious inhibitions somewhat waned, but the scope of my visions vastly increased. I now seemed to wander through titanic sunken porticos and labyrinths of weedy cyclopean walls, clearly parts of a bizarre no water city. that day on my life has been a nightmare of brooding and apprehension. And that look in the staring-eyed face of my self-slain uncle in another dream might be sheer fancy on my part. But why had my uncle killed himself? Soon the dreams and disturbed feelings gained on me, so that I had to drop my regular work. 
meanwhile spending most hours of the day by the sea. Desperate to find a way to escape my dreams, I tried avoiding sleep as much as possible, to no avail. One night I had a frightful dream in which I met my mother beside the sea. She had not aged one day since her disappearance. As certain definite details began to enter the dreams, their horror increased a thousandfold until I felt I must do something. It was then that I began an intensive study of other cases of amnesia and visions, feeling that I might thereby objectivize my trouble and shake clear of its emotional grip. I began to search feverishly for every scrap of information bearing on the studies of that other one during the dark years. This was when the dreams began so unfailingly to have the aspect of memories, and when my mind began to link them with my growing abstract disturbances. I felt that the snatches of sight I experienced had a profound and terrible meaning and a frightful connection with myself. The strange tiara kept puzzling me, and I was unsafe from my dreams, which no longer came at a particular time and seemed to grow in vividness. The curious knowledge and strange conduct of my body's late tenant troubled me more and more as I learned further details from persons, papers, and magazines. I soon found that my dreams had indeed no counterpart in the overwhelming bulk of true amnesia cases. I decided to make my case known among the scientific society, sending letters explaining my symptoms and asking for help. There was, meanwhile, a feeling of profound and inexplicable horror concerning myself. Unable to bear the tension of what one day my reflection might be, I broke all the mirrors in the house to avoid looking at my own person. One day, following my latest and most disturbing vision, there was a delivery from a mailman who was trying, like most of the residents in Narkom, to avoid being anywhere near my house. There it was, forwarded to me by the Psychological Society, the letter which opened the culminating and most horrible phase of the whole mad ordeal. It bore the signature of one Robert B. F. Mackenzie, up-and-coming student psychologist. What I read made me both agitated and terrified. Before I would do anything the doctor suggested, I decided to inform the police. The cursed letter mentioned a recent archaeological dig, which uncovered part of what seemed to be an entrance to a building of unidentified architecture, origin, and civilization. It bore an uncanny resemblance to the description of the city and the symbols I saw in my dreams. Dr. Mackenzie informed me that he had taken the liberty, due to the urgent nature of my letters, to set up a meeting later this day, in front of the freshly unearthed entrance, not forgetting to enclose the coordinates to the dig site and meet him I would, without hesitation. It was only for a moment that I hesitated, for more than curiosity and scientific zeal was driving me on against my growing fear. Words can convey only fractionally the welter of dread and bewilderment which ate at my spirit. I knew this place. I knew what lay before me and what had lain overhead before the myriad towering stories had fallen to dust and debris. Then, for the first time, I felt acutely the motion and dampness of the surrounding air. It was sheer madness that impelled and guided me. Pervading everything was the most nauseous fishy odor imaginable. I do not know how long it was before I dared to lift that abhorrent skeleton. I temporized and made excuses to myself. In the dark, I collected my courage, finally lifting the long dead creature. What I expected was there. Either I was dreaming or time and space had become a mockery. 
The thing which had caught my first subconscious glance and supplied the touch of bizarre horror was the tiara, an exact duplicate of the one I had found in my attic. At length I tremblingly pulled the book from its container and stared fascinatedly at the well-known hieroglyph on the cover. It seemed to be in prime condition, and the curvilinear letters inside held me in almost as hypnotized a state as if I could read them. Indeed, I cannot swear that I did not actually read them in some transient and terrible access of abnormal memory. No eye had seen, no hand had touched that book since the advent of man to this planet. And yet, when I took a closer look upon it, in that frightful abyss, I saw that the queerly pigmented letters on the brittle, eon brown cellulose pages were not indeed any nameless hieroglyphs of Earth's youth. They were instead the letters of our familiar alphabet, spelling out the words of the English language in my own handwriting. Now, indeed, the essence of pure nightmare was upon me. Sanity departed as I laid my eyes upon a corner too well known to me. Then, out of the shadows, it appeared. His appearance, especially those unwinking, watery eyes which one never saw shut, was certainly shocking enough, his voice disgusting. It was then when the most unnameable terror took place. The answer I sought. The creature spoke of a late race, of a shape neither human nor aquatic, which had lived till only 50 million years before the advent of man. This was the greatest race of all, because it alone had conquered the secret of time. Of all things surviving physically and directly from that eon distant world, there remained only certain ruins of great stones under the sea. Mementos of a city called Arlia, where the archpriest of the old ones, the great Cthulhu, waits dreaming. The beings of this dying elder race had looked ahead for a way to awaken their gods, and had set their minds en masse into that future race best adapted to house them, with its sole purpose to bring their own perverse Bible, a book named Necronomicon, back from oblivion. The projected mind, the body of the organism of the future, would learn all that could be learned of the chosen age. Meanwhile, the displaced mind, thrown back to the displacer's body, would be carefully guarded. It was, however, the other reason the future minds were chosen that drove me to despair. That is why, for all the creature's monstrousness, he was not unfamiliar to me. And I knew too well what I must be. For was not the memory of the evil tiara still fresh? Who or what was my mother? I now knew that she had never died. Instead, she had gone to a spot her dead brother had learned about, and had lead to a realm whose wonders, destined for him as well, he had spurned with a smoking pistol. This was to be my realm too. I could not escape it. I would never die, but would live with those who had lived since before man ever walked the earth. By the time I could tell just where delirious dream left off and true memory began, my choice and sacrifice were clear. The awful truth behind my tortured years of dreaming hinges absolutely upon the actuality of what I saw in that hidden cave. There is no hope. All too truly, there lies upon this world of man a mocking and incredible shadow out of time. The old ones can never be destroyed. For the present, they only rest. But someday, soon, they will rise again for the tribute Great Cthulhu craved. But now they must wait once more. For bringing the upper earthman's death I must do a heavy task. The tense extremes of horror are lessening, and I feel queerly drawn toward the unknown sea deeps instead of fear in them. I hear strange things to which I listen with exultation instead of terror. Stupendous and unheard of splendors await me below, and I shall seek them soon. I shall swim out to the sea and dive down through black abysses to Cyclopean and many column down here. And in that lair of the deep ones, we shall dwell amidst wonder and glory forever. Ia. Ia. 